Welcome back to Champion News Talk Radio, brought to you by championnews.net, your choice for the conservative voice. Before the break, our founder, Jack Roser, um, was mentioning a little story. I want to hear your, your gun story, and then we're going to hear more from Representative Tom Morrison about concealed carry. Well, we, in another planet long ago, I was a private in the Army, and I'm talking about the early part of uh, 1943. And uh, uh, I, I was, had been cycled through f uh, Fort Leonard Wood down in Missouri, a hellhole of a place. And uh, I was doing close, I was hospitalized, and I was doing close order drill. But uh, I did, o o did night KP, which meant I had the next day off. And uh, so I was a private. And, uh, but I went to the uh, post uh, library and I got a, a book on the uh, Army 45. I've always been nuts about guns. My dad gave me a 410 shotgun when I was 12 years old, a little single shot thing, which I've still got. But uh, I, I was fascinated with the 45, but I'd never picked one up or shot it. So I got the manual arms on it from the library and got in the bus and I went up to the uh, range on the north end of, of the post and uh, I knew there was one up there that only the first three grades and officers were allowed to shoot. I definitely was not allowed there. But I walked up to this, uh, this old uh, captain and uh, I reported him to him and I wanted, told him I wanted to shoot the 45 for record. Why do you want to do that, soldier? And uh, I said, well, I think it's the duty of every soldier to be proficient in every weapon, sir. You know? <laughs> so uh, the upshot of it was he let me shoot and he put me in position number nine he had 18 positions on his range, and we shot at six by sixes at 15 and 25 yards. And uh, so I was there with a whole bunch of officers. And uh, anyway, uh, you, to shoot, ex there's, uh, there's, sharp, uh, there's uh, marksman, sharpshooter, and expert. Expert, you got to shoot 92% of the bulls. And uh, first time up, I shot 90%, never having picked up the gun before. So the captain comes over to me, he says, uh, soldier, he says, uh, do you want to work here? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he says, I've got a guy that can't shoot expert. And he says, you'll shoot expert next time. He says, I'll let you use my gun, uh, which there's some that are accurized. But anyway, I, I uh, spent uh, a nice three months as an instructor trying to teach officers to shoot the 45. Huh. And it was interesting because I'll tell you, you'd be safe coming through a doorway if the untrained guy with a forty-five was shooting at you. Mm -hmm. There'd probably be most of the holes in, in the walls and the ceiling. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's a method to shooting guns, and and uh, it's fun. The forty-five is a marvelous weapon, and I could I could go on and on about uh, how it originated and what a wonderful stopping weapon it is. It, it is the gun policemen should carry. Well, I want to hear about least. conceal and carry in Illinois. The last yeah. state of the union to get conceal and carry. Yeah, but there are there there are a lot of. Them. Well, there were there were a couple of um, competing bills, if you want to say, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about pensions later this this uh, show. But um, Senator Kwame Raoul in the Senate wanted a bill that was much much harsher toward Second Amendment supporters or gun owners, uh, law abiding gun owners. Um, this bill. A couple of key provisions. One, it was a shall issue bill instead of a may issue. So what that means to the, the typical gun owner is the presumption is that you are a safe, responsible gun owner. That if you just follow these laws or, or these uh, uh, regulations, then the state police is going to issue you a permit. Um, Does it take a long time to have a concealed carry permit? You said you have to take a class and then there's a fee. Uh, right, I had 16 hours of, of uh, training that includes range time. Um, and uh, so, the, the, but the most important thing is it's a shall issue. That's important in the law because, again, it, it, the, the rights are granted to the individual rather than pleading your case to the state saying, oh, please, you know, issue, issue a permit for me where I have to prove why I need one, why I want one. Okay, so I mean, there are some states that have that may issue and, and it's a lot more onerous on the, the gun owner. Okay. Um, so that was an achievement for us. Uh, the second thing was this bill preempts home rule. So think about ah. some of the municipalities like now the city of Chicago. Now it's uniform through the state. Right. So the city of Chicago, Oak Park, uh, Morton, Morton Grove, Illinois. I don't know where they are today, but I mean, I remember back in the 80s, 
they were really out front in banning handguns. That's yeah. right. And so yeah. what this bill would do is it preempts the ability for an individual municipality to outlaw a concealed carry permit. So state so, trumps any municipality on this, right. in this bill. Well, that's a and good that, thing. That was very, very important. And so, you know, some of the prohibitions uh, for permit holders, you know, we're not thrilled about those. What are some of the prohibitions? Well, um, the gun-free zones we were talking about in the last segment. Right. So schools are included in that, um, parks, uh, even a forest preserve. Uh, so consider if you live in Cook County, which I do, um, you will not be able to have your concealed uh, weapon in a Cook County forest preserve. Think what that means to a woman that's running on the trails. I, I agree with you. I think... Uh, uh, that's a great equalizer. And women, uh, I mean, who's most likely to be carrying a gun in Chicago? It's be some woman working in a hospital coming home at night. I think, I think concealed carry is, is a very pro-woman issue. As mm -hmm. you said, it is mm -hmm. an equalizer. Someone who, who uh, weighs 100 pounds going against someone who's 300 pounds on drugs, whatever, mm. uh, it's not going to be a match. And, and like I said, the police, even a cell phone, 911, it's not an the, adequate the respond, protection. No, that it's not an adequate time. protection. So those are some of the prohibitions that I, I was talking about. Mass transit, it's not allowed. Um, I think once the Illinois public gets more used to the idea of, of permits, then we can address some of those individual prohibitions in the future. Well, very good. So we're progressively uh, <laughs> getting to where we need to be. It's, it's with slow. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a crawl. But um, Well, you were saying something to me before the show. One state, it took them 10 years to do something, but now they actually have moved it. Was it pensions that we were talking about? Like anything, we start somewhere. Oh, I was, right. Uh, the state of Michigan in regards to right to work. That's it. Uh, you know, you think about Michigan was... The, if not the birthplace, certainly a home to the major uh, unions like the United Auto Workers. Walter well, Luther and his uh, leather glove tactics of unionizing right. people. And really, and, the French uh, thing back in the 30s, they adopted the French uh, method of forcing unionism by occupying the place of work. Mm -hmm. Nothing moved. They just took over the place. Uh, so a state like it Michigan set off a lot of abuses in a labor thing. Right. Well, the, the idea that Michigan is now a right to work state. There's hope. It's that's right. There's that hope. was unthinkable even a few years ago. But those who who understood that it's it is pro worker. It's for the freedom of workers to decide whether or not they want to join a union. Um, it's it is an outrage to have it otherwise. Yeah. But to see, force but, a person. You know, most of the people that are in unions never have voted to be in a union. Somebody, you know, 40 years earlier, they put a big leather glove thing on and, and uh, got a contract signed with the General Motors or any of the owners that had a plant. And so that was the start of the union. Now that they got a union, the stinking state law says that you must join that damned union. That's horrible. Now, that is not right. That is a outraged for the yeah. working man. Well, well, you know what, this but, is good though, because but, all these issues can be done in this type of manner of where you start opening the door and then you can keep moving them in a better direction. I guess I'm just trying to encourage your listeners uh, and viewers to just be perseverant. We have to hmm. be perseverant, um, find, uh, you know, take the baby steps. The left does it to us all the time. Mm -hmm. They, they, uh, tighten the noose on, on regulations. They do, you know, raise taxes a little bit here and there. Uh, we need to go in the opposite direction and start whittling back those restrictions. But it has to be reversed to progressively, Recapturing the too. freedoms that, that, we, that gave us the prosperity in the first place and the freedoms in the first place. Look, look at how important it is in Illinois. Uh, the uh, teachers union, I call the IEA, the Illinois Miseducation Association, but they take from the teachers in the K-12 system. Uh, the last record that I've had my look at is from uh, the year 2010. They took $132 million from the teachers in dues. According to the Beck decision at the Supreme Court level of the United States, they should return 80% of that to the teachers. That's $100 million a year that that stinking union has taken from the teachers to perform outrages in many different ways by spreading that immense amount of money around to corrupt 
almost everything in the state of Illinois. Now, let me ask you, Jack. Uh, the union is not just going to turn around and give people the money back, the teachers the money back. What do teachers need to do to get 80% of their dues back? Michael, I think we're going to be going to a break because I think that's going to be a longer conversation.